I want to keep these opening remarks uh, very brief uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that uh, we're running just slightly behind. Uh, more important reason is that I actually think uh, Larry really needs no introduction. Now, I had a mentor who said to me, um, I need no introduction, but I always really appreciate one. Um, and so I, I definitely want to say a few words about the amazing work he's done. Um, but Larry really has uh, become a phenomenon. Um, in the short period of time since, I believe, April of this year, that the TED talk that he did on his book, Republic Lost and Campaign Finance Reform, has been up, it's had 691,000 views. Um, now, um, that is a remarkable measure of, of the impact, um, but it's, it's actually uh, an impact that, in some ways, comes after a, a career in which Larry has really um, has really become a, have been a, become a pioneer in, in each of the areas he's, he's worked in. Uh, his work uh, on the internet uh, and, its, and, its, and its architecture, uh, legal and, and otherwise, his, was pioneering and very influential. And since he's started to work in this area, he's really changed uh, the terms of the discussion uh, as well as uh, really had influence, um, not only through his own work, but through the organization uh, that he has founded. Um, and so I will uh, let him talk a bit about that. Um, but what I would like to do is to, is to thank you once again uh, for coming out uh, and thank Larry for um, providing our keynote. And, and I'll look forward to continuing the conversation this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And to offer a talk which I think has one controversial idea in it. Uh, so that's why I want to call it getting, getting clear. Getting clear on some things that I think we should know enough about to be able to finish the debate that has gone on for, I think, too long. Okay, So getting to that place, clear, I think it's important to remember that as important as that is, is how, meaning there are those of us who believe that our government is corrupt and is corrupt in a pathologically sense of corrupt, but the important thing is to understand how it's corrupt. And how it's corrupt is important if we're going to talk about what we can do to fix that corruption. Okay, so how is it corrupt? Let me start with that. And I think we should distinguish between a micro perspective and a macro perspective. And the micro perspective, I think, is ultimately the perspective we spend too little time focusing on. So after the last election, a number of freshman congressmen do what freshman congressmen do after elections, which is to trundle up to Cambridge to attend the Kennedy School How to Be a Congressman class. And after one of those days, about a dozen of these members uh, met with a bunch of us to talk about campaign finance. And one member started the meeting by saying, I ran for Congress in my pajamas. Now, he came from California, so I thought maybe this was just an eclectic sort of candidate. But I, but I said to him, well, well, what exactly do you mean by that? And he said, I literally did nothing except sit in my house in my pajamas, calling people, raising money to fund the commercials that ran on my campaign. That's all that I did. And I said, so how has your life changed since you have been elected? And he said, well, now I have to wear a suit. But it's the same activity. And what I didn't know at the time, but as Huffington Post reported soon after this conversation, all of these members had received literally that day a memo from their leadership in the form of a PowerPoint uh, deck that included this slide that Huffington Post released that described for them their model daily schedule. So out of nine hours, four hours was to be devoted to call time, raising money. And this doesn't even include what they were supposed to do after the day ended, when many of them spend their time going around to other cocktail parties or fundraising events. So the point is, they were focusing on this future life, which was not very different from the life they had just ended, a life that was going to be spending enormous amount of time raising money. Collaborate, uh, corroborating a statistic which I had pulled together from looking at everything I could find about estimates of this time, that they're spending anywhere from 30 to 70% of their time 
raising money. Okay, now, how should we understand that? I think this is the best image we can have, and I don't have a good video of it, but this is the best image we can have. Remember the Skinner box, right? So the Skinner box is a device where we take an animal, either a rat or a pigeon, I used a pigeon just to be charitable here, um, and you force them to learn the routine they need to learn in order to raise, I'm sorry, not raise, to get the food they need to get to live, right? And, and amazingly, these creatures learn all sorts of dances that they need to go through to get the food that they need to give. And interesting, psychologically, it's best if you don't give a perfect return. It's got to be a probabilistic return that keeps them focused. So it's the slot machine theory of motivation. They've got to have a probabilistic return which keeps them focused on the behaviors they need to engage in in order to, ra to raise the money they need to fund their campaigns. And the question we need to focus on is, what does that behavior do to them? What does it do to them? Right. Which is very different from the question Ezra raised today, and I just want to pick on Ezra for a minute here. <laughs> because the question is not, the question of campaign funding is not, does tracking the money help us beat Nate Silver on our blog, right? That's not why this is an important problem, right? The question is, does this money or this way we raise money corrupt the process of representation for the people after they've engaged in this behavior? So what does it do to them? And that question is answered by focusing, I think, on who are they calling? Who are they spending their enormous amount of time calling? What kind of person? Because if it were random selection of all of us, that would be one thing. But if it's not a random selection of all of us, that's a very different thing. And indeed, that's in fact what we know. Look from 2010, um, using Center's uh, data from 2010, a quarter of 1% of people give $200 or more, or gave $200 or more in 2010 to any federal election. 0.05% gave the maximum amount to any federal candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, gave $10,000 or more in aggregate to federal candidates in that election. And in this election cycle, as Demos put it in the interim statistic, 0.00042%, and that totals to 132 Americans, gave 60% of the super PAC money that was contributed. Right, so the point is to recognize when you have such a tiny number of people who are the target of the fundraising activities, it can't help but develop psychologically for all of these members a kind of sixth sense, a constant awareness about how what they do might affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not on issues one to ten, the issues that they're constituents maybe notice the most, but it issues 11 to 1,000, where the lobbyists have their most prominent effect. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green, and then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> so it is this behavior, this experience, this way of life, this Skinner box or funders box that I think needs to be our focus. And when you think about that funder's box, we have certain expectations. One expectation is that this will bend policy to their ends, to the ends of the funders. And though there was some obscurity in the political science literature about this, I think we have to conclude now that that expectation is supported by the data. There's direct evidence about this. It was originally thrown into some doubt by my colleagues at Harvard, suggestion from this paper that there is little relationship between money and legislative votes. But that conclusion was itself then thrown in doubt, um, first by two meta-analyses that looked at the very same data which they looked at and concluded, as Stropman says, the hypothesis that campaign contributions have no effect on voting behavior is rejected at the 1% level. And then more recently, Clayton Peoples did a much more expansive study of 7,000 votes between 91 and 2006 and found statistically significant contributor influence in seven of the eight houses. The only one where they didn't was in the house that passed McCain-Feingold, which interestingly, if you get them to focus on ethics legislation, they turn out to behave more ethically. Interesting. 
uh, strategy, maybe, just to have them vote on one of these things every single election cycle. So that's the direct evidence. And the indirect evidence here, I mean, you know, Marty is right here in the front. So Mart, uh, Martin's paper, which then turned into uh, the really fantastic book, which looked at um, you find when Americans with different income levels, different policy preferences, actual policy outcomes strongly reflect the preferences of the most affluent, but bear virtually no relationship to the preferences of the poor and middle inc income Americans. It points to this vast discrepancy between what we'd expect and what we find when we track results as a function of affluence inside the system. And then this is also supported by uh, Larry Bartle's uh, recent uh, analysis of people at the very, very highest level of wealth, way above what anything that Marty could look at, suggesting how policy tilts to the wealthy, and we can observe the wealthy because of the point I just made before, are the funders. Okay, so that's the first point, to think about what it does to them. And then we can also think about what it does to the system. Because in an obvious way that we don't recognize, I think, clearly enough, in any world where tiniest fraction of the public is disproportionately driving the funding for elections, what that means is that the tiniest number of them, really, really a tiny, tiny number of them, are going to have the capacity to block reform. I still haven't found anything other than a block of cheese for this. I'm looking for a rock, but block reform, right? They have the capacity to block reform because this tiny, tiny number is almost trivial to gather together around any major issue that you would, cons would have a desire to affect. So we should expect here that Washington would develop a kind of economy of no, an economy of no, because the simplest good for the lobbyists to sell is the ability to say no, the ability to block any reform that might otherwise flow through the system. This is an economy then that depends upon polarization. It's economy that depends upon dysfunction. Dysfunction becomes the business model. And uh, uh, the, you know, Li Fang had this wonderful little piece in The Nation where he found a website that was then subsequently taken down by a lobbying firm that was explicitly advertising their ability to lock into senators' ability to hold legislation as one of the things they could sell, the ability to translate that power into the ability to block change. So some in the room, not to pick on Ezra again, but some in the room believe the problem is polarization. But the point is to see how polarization is the solution to the problem of fundraising. Polarization makes it easier for people to leverage the opportunity to fundraise because it makes it easier for them to reliably deliver the answer of no against people who are interested, for people who are interested in stopping the change that might otherwise flow. So I think this conclusion, too, is supported. It's sort of conventional wisdom, but I think uh, Mann and Ornstein's latest book is really fantastic in bringing this out, describing how we now have a, a government more loyal to party than to country, and as a result, the political system has become the grievously hobbled of the times when the country faces unusually serious challenges and grave threats. Okay, now, all of that, I think, is from the context of looking at the micro behavior and understanding how it's going to affect the system. We should also think about it from the macro perspective. And ask the question, what does the current structure do for the potential of change? Deviating from the status quo. And now think about it from the perspective of the leaders. I'm picking these two as the leaders of these two political parties. And strategically, as a leader of the political party, thinking about the willingness you have to devote your political party to a certain political objective. So imagine if you looked at the pharmaceutical, the way we fund drugs in the United States. And you, as a leader of the political party, you're asking yourself the question, should we take on the challenge of radically changing the way we fund drugs in the United States? You know, maybe increasing competition with pharmaceutical companies or changing the way the government reimburses, or changing the patent system so that they can't extract such super, major, uh, uh, super rents for their innovations. When you ask that question as a leader of a political party and you recognize the fierce competition that exists between these two parties, and how a tiny shift of money from one side to the other can devastate your chances, you can see why there would be little, little chance that the political party leadership is going to adopt a position contrary 
in this space, especially when you see the relatively significant amount of money coming in from this kind of interest, and this, in this case, pretty evenly balanced between Democrats and Republicans. Or imagine you think that the way we produce energy in the United States has a lot to be desired. We have a very important need to internalize some externalities, carbon production externalities, but you as a leader of political party have to decide whether you're gonna take this issue up because to take it up might be to alienate a significant funding force, um, which of course the Democrats have lost in some sense that so far, but still there's significant amount of money they still get from the people who are eager not uh, to see this policy issue taken up. Same thing on the context of Wall Street. Um, you know, if you think that the way we have banks in Wall Street right now might not be a good idea, we ought to take on this structure and to make ourselves the enemy of very powerful interests here. You have to face the fact that this is the largest contributor, largest contributor by sector in our political system. And the Democrats have already seen the punishment that comes from even raising your head above the line here. So the Democrats' numbers right now are 8 million versus 19 million. This is 2012. 2008, it was practically equal. So they've already been punished even for the meager steps that they've taken. But again, the point is that you as a leader of the party need to internalize the fact that you will be punished even more if you take on this kind of issue, which might suggest why the Democrats were eager to roll out this Connecticut uh, congressman, former um, Goldman Sachs executive, a Democrat who is proposing a bill to deregulate derivatives. Yes, who can possibly believe this? But deregulate derivatives, the meager regulation Dodd-Frank puts on top of them are, is too much, Goldman Sachs says, because it's too complicated. Of course, most people don't recognize that's very complicated only because Goldman Sachs lawyers, facil lobbyists facilitated the process of making it the most complex regulation imaginable. But this is a pretty eager way to try to signal to Wall Street, even Democrats can love Wall Street once again. Um, and of course, finally, and most tragically, uh, for the nation, I think, if you think about the uh, decision of a Democratic leader or Republican leader to take on a particular issue in the context of guns, it also focuses on the sense in which this can be political suicide at the party level, which means that the structure of competitive races with massive contributions coming from these special interests preserve the status quo, locks us into the status quo with policy, producing, again, what I think is this unprecedentedly sclerotic political structure, right? So as Hemingway said in The Sun Also Rises, how did we go bankrupt? The answer is gradually and then suddenly, suddenly now we are bankrupt from the capacity of this political system to take on political issues and address them in a sensible way. Okay, that's how we are here. But let me go back to the part that still there are people that want to quibble about that we are here, that this is something we should call, quote, corruption. Um, I tripped upon this story when reading an article by Zachary Brugman. This is the question of the framers and the framers' design for the president. And when the framers were thinking about how to structure the president, um, they resolved that there would be an electoral college because national public elections was not really imaginable. But then the question is, what would happen if there was a tie in the electoral college? Who would resolve that tie? And uh, it was suggested originally that the Senate might resolve this tie. And as Brugman puts together the response to that suggestion, he says, as he quotes, quote, referring the appointment to the Senate lays a certain foundation for corruption and aristocracy. Noted Williamson from North Carolina. The aristocratic complexion proceeds from the change in the mode of appointing the president, which makes him dependent on the Senate. George Mason similarly asserted that this dependence on the Senate, while there were simultaneous indirect dependencies on the people, would subvert the Constitution. Mason said he would prefer the government of Prussia to one which will put under the power of the hands of seven or eight men and fix an aristocracy worse than absolute monarchy. And James Wilson agreed because of his, quote, dependence on them, the Senate, the president will not be the man of the people he ought to be. He would be a minion of the Senate. The dependent relationship posed a dangerous tendency to aristocracy. Now, if you think of that language, what's odd in that language is the way the word corruption is used. I think it's intuitively clear to us how 
there's a tendency to aristocracy, at least if you imagine the Senate filled with rich people, which when 70% of the Senate is made of millionaires the way it is today, isn't such a crazy idea to imagine. But wherein is the corruption? The corruption in having the Senate choose the president on the happening of a tie in the Electoral College, something that's happened twice in our history. And the reason why this is odd for us is that we have a very modern sense of the word corruption. And the framers had a different sense of the term corruption. As uh, Lisa Hill describes it, until the end of the 18th century, corruption had a much broader meaning than it does today. It referred less to the actions of individuals and more to the general moral health of the body politic. So what that means is that they could predicate corruption not just of individuals, but it would predicate of institutions too. So it would predicate of the presidency, it would predicate of a society, it would predicate of a parliament, it would predicate of whole bodies. And it would predicate of them meaning that it was proper to call them corrupt if certain conditions obtained. But that means we can distinguish between the corruption of the institution and the corruption of individuals within the institution. So you can have a corrupt institution, and that doesn't mean that any of the individuals within the institution are necessarily corrupt. They could all be angels, but still the way the institution is created, the dependencies that exist with it, produce the corruption of the institution. And you could have corrupt individuals, but no corrupt institution. You'd have just have criminals, but within an institution that's perfectly legal and uh, not corrupt. So the point is the necessary and sufficient conditions for each kind of corruption are distinct. Okay. Now the suggestion of this two kinds of corruption is inconsistent with how the Supreme Court speaks right now. The Supreme Court speaks as if the only kind of corruption that's relevant is individual corruption. Corruption of individuals, quid pro quo corruption. It doesn't even suggest or contemplate the idea of a way of talking about corruption that predicates of the institution. Um, and one thing to kind of stick in their eye when they talk that way is to note that only a non-originalist could possibly think that the only relevant corruption is a corruption that applies to the level of the individual. Because for the framers of the Constitution, corruption existed whenever there was an improper dependence of an institution upon an influence that was not to be with that institution. That was the point about the president. The mere possibility that the president would be chosen by the Senate was enough for them to say the presidency would be corrupted, not because they expected the senators to buy off the president or the president to buy off the senators, but because the dependence upon the Senate produced the wrong influence in the president. That was a corruption of the president. And for our Congress, uh, the framers certainly uh, would have recognized the way in which we've allowed an improper dependence to evolve inside the institution of Congress. They had an intended dependence for this institution. As Madison put in Federalist 52, it was to be an institution dependent upon the people alone, but the actual dependence that's been produced is a dependence that's not dependence upon the people alone, but increasingly dependence also upon a funders. So this is a dependence uh, democracy then that has its dependence upon two groups, the funders and the people, competing dependencies and conflicting dependencies because the people are not the funders. People are not the funders, meaning we don't have a system where the uh, government is dependent upon the people alone. This is technically and precisely corruption from the originalist view. Okay, now, why is that important? If this were a room of lawyers, it would be much more significant, uh, obvious why this was important. It's important because the only place the Supreme Court has allowed uh, First Amendment values to be restricted is if Congress can say we are restricting these for the purpose of addressing corruption. And so if you think of corruption as only about individuals, then that creates lots of restrictions on the ability of Congress to address this kind of corruption. But if you could get the court to recognize that at least the framers would have thought of corruption of the institution, it broadens the range of plausible, legitimate um, uh, regulations that Congress might adopt. So I think the originalist view is true, and it's also essential for dealing with some of the most important campaign finance cases that are just over the horizon, one that was already mentioned this morning, uh, the McCutcheon case, for example. So the McCutcheon case addresses the question of 
do the aggregate limits on contributions uh, violate the First Amendment? Because you're stopping somebody from spending $5 million in contributions, right? And it's not hard to see how this could be happening. Imagine somebody wanted to give $1,000 to every, um, uh, every, every Democrat in every House seat. Okay, so um, $1,000 times 435 is way more than the maximum amount you are allowed to give in federal elections. So that clearly exceeds the aggregate amount. But from a quid pro quo perspective, this is obviously below the amount the Supreme Court believes for each of these races that could constitute quid pro quo corruption. So if the only kind of corruption you can appeal to is quid pro quo corruption, you have no way to show why the aggregate limits are constitutional limits on a person's ability to participate. It's not quid pro quo corruption, but it plainly and obviously exacerbates the kind of dependence corruption that I'm talking about. Because the one thing we know from the data, and especially in, in Montana, they did a great job in putting this data together, is that when you remove the limits on contributions, you shrink the number of contributors. So the business model of fundraising shifts away from talking to lots of people to shifting towards talking to as few a number as you can, which means if we eliminated the aggregate contribution limits, what we'd expect is an even smaller number of people would be contributing to campaigns, so that if the small number is what's constituting the dependence corruption dependent upon this tiny fraction as opposed to dependent upon the people alone, um, then we're only increasing corruption by removing these limits. So this gives you a way to argue for those limits, which is different from quid pro quo corruption. And I also think it's the key to thinking about how to address the issue raised in speech now. This was the case decided by the DC Circuit. The Supreme Court didn't review the case, um, uh, which, which created the opportunity for super PACs. So we heard a little bit of this today from, uh, uh, from Senator Murphy. Um, but I think it, it really was quite compellingly described in a panel exchange that I was participating in with uh, Evan Bai. Evan Bai was asked by John Samples of Cato. Uh, Samples said, well, you know, we have no good data to suggest that money buys results in elections, do we? Um, and, um, you know, inciting the kind of ancillary research. And, and Bai kind of rolls his eyes. And he says, you have no idea how Citizens United has changed Capitol Hill. He said, before Citizens United, the incumbents were the barons. The incumbents had absolute confidence. As long as they didn't sleep with an intern, they could be reelected. But after Citizens United, every single incumbent is terrified that 30 days before the election, some super PAC is going to come in and drop a million dollars on the other side. OK, so that fear produces a sensible response in the senators. So what do they do in response? Well, they have to buy, this is my word, but you get the sense, a kind of super PAC insurance. So a super PAC insurance is an insurance policy that basically guarantees that if a million dollars gets dropped against you, somebody will come in and drop a million dollars on your side to balance it out. But you need to guarantee somebody will be there to have your back if, in fact, you need to be defended. And how do we buy insurance? Well, of course, you have to pay your premium in advance, long before the time you actually need the money. You have to have established the relationship sufficient to give somebody a reason to step in and back you up. So how do you pay your premium in advance? You know, well, Senator, we'd like to help you. We only can support people who support us at 80%. You have a target of a way you need to behave in advance in order to guarantee that the super PAC will be there if, in fact, you need the super PAC to be there. Mann and Ornstein describe a similar story as they say, as one senator told us, we have all had experiences like the following. A lobbyist or interest representative will be in my office. He, will, he or she will say, you know, Americans for a better America really, really want this amendment passed, and they have more money than God. I don't know what they'll do with their money if they don't get what they want, but they are capable of spending a fortune to make anybody who disappoints them regret it. No money has to be spent, Man and Ornstein say, in order to get their, that their desired outcome. So the point is, this dynamic also manifests what I want to call dependence corruption. Because you see the members beginning to align their behavior in light of their dependence upon the super PAC behaving in a particular way. And because they're aligning their behavior in order to get the super PAC to behave in a certain way, they're revealing the kind of dependence they have, again, a dependence on the tiniest fraction of interest inside the election. Um, and as Murphy said this morning, it is developing a culture of dependency, 
these super PACs are. This dependency, which is again inconsistent with the dependence upon the people alone. In this sense, it is in this sense that I say that Congress is corrupt. It is corrupt in this dependence corruption sense of corrupt. Even if it's not corrupt, and I'm happy to stipulate it's not corrupt in a quid pro quo sense of corruption. Okay, so how do you do? What do you do about this? How do you fix it? Well, if you focus on the problem as dependency corruption, I think the analytics to fixing it are pretty clear. The problem is constituted by members spending way too much time fundraising from too tiny a slice of America. The solution to this problem is to reduce the time they're fundraising, but even if you don't reduce the time that they're fundraising, at least spread out the people from whom they are raising the money. So if they're raising from a random selection of all of us, I'd be okay if they spent 70% of their time talking to a random selection of all of us. That would force a kind of reflection in their behavior that's reinforcing of the democracy. The problem is it's the 0.05% they're raising the money from. So spread out the funder influence to get to the ideal we can imagine of dependence upon the people alone. And to do this, I don't think you need to amend the Constitution. I think to do this, this is I think Michael's point that he was making this morning, I think he's absolutely right. All you need is a single statute that would change the way we fund elections to move us from the big dollar funded elections to small dollar funded elections. And at the federal level, there are plenty of wonderful suggestions precisely of precisely how to do this right now. The Fair Elections Now Act, which in 2010 in the House came within 20 votes of passing, creates a matching fund system that would do this. Uh, the American Anti-Corruption Act has, a, has what's described right now as a tax credit to do this. this. This bill, of course, is the most ambitious reform proposal we've seen in 100 years in America, but the funding proposal is basically functioning as a tax credit proposal right now. In my book, I talk about a voucher proposal building on Ian Ayers and Bruce Ackerman's idea to uh, voluntarily have people opting into taking small vouchers only and then fundraising to raise those vouchers plus contributions limited at $100 per person. John Sarbanes has a proposal that would match all three of these. There's a matching fund component to these. There's a tax credit component to this. And there's a pilot program for vouchers that gets combined. The point is, all of these, each of them, is focusing on fixing the dynamic of this corruption by spreading out the influence more broadly. And the corruption here, characterized by a, a reality where the per capita influence of the top 1% is 10 times the per capita influence of the bottom 99% combined. So in my view, the analytics are easy once you see the problem in the right way. The obvious hard part is the politics. And maybe the impossibly hard part is the politics. Right? Because all of the reforms we're talking about right here would be reforms that shrink the power of K Street. Uh, and K Street, of course, as Jim Cooper has told us, um, is now a, uh, Capitol Hill is now a farm league for K Street. If you imagine an emerging business model inside of Capitol Hill, members, staffers, and bureaucrats focused on this business model of their life after government, their life as lobbyists. So public citizen calculated between 98 and 2004, 50% of the Senate left to become lobbyists, 42% of the House, those numbers, um, uh, I, th I think, have certainly gone up. And as United Republic um, calculated last year for the members they tracked, the average salary increase for those leaving to become lobbyists is 1,452%. So if you have a system where everybody depends upon the system surviving, this is their retirement package. You know, when Chris Murphy was saying, oh, so terrible, these guys are retiring, you know, going back to their districts. Are they really going back to their districts? Or are they just going to K Street and finally cashing in and making real bucks after paying paid small amounts of money to be members of Congress? When you have a system where everybody depends upon the system surviving, it's certainly fair to ask, how is it possible to imagine ever giving them the incentive to change this? Well, I'm not sure it's possible, but I think there are a couple of steps we've got to take. The first step is, again, to get clear about what the problem is. The problem is not corporate personhood. The problem is not, quote, money is speech. The problem is not polarization or gerrymandering. All of these may be problems. I'm not denying we shouldn't find ways to address all of them. But it's not the problem that defines this corruption. It's not the problem that defines the particular mechanism which is leading them to be no longer responsive in the way the system was designed for them to be responsive. So that's the first step. The second step is to frame this correctly which means to frame it in a way that could actually generate a political movement powerful enough to win. 
And that means a cross-partisan movement, which doesn't, I'm not saying a kind of kumbaya bipartisan movement where we all pretend we love each other, but I mean a movement that cuts across partisan lines, that frames it in a way that liberals and conservatives both can genuinely agree that this is the issue that they want to fight about. And to do this, we need a frame, here it is, there's a frame, that can somehow bring together people like that and people like this, right? two radically different sorts of people. And my view is the only frame that can do this is one that focuses, again, as United Republic has nicely done with the American Anti-Corruption Act, on corruption. Keeping corruption at its core is a way to talk to different groups so that different groups identify in this conversation the part that animates them and motivates them. Again, the Anti-Corruption Act does this, I think, powerfully. And third step, this is the part that I don't think we're going to have consensus on or even agreement about, and it just might be false. So here we go. Um, the third step is we've got to find a way to act with real consequence here. Because memes alone in this fight are not going to be enough. It's not just about finding the right way to talk about the problem. If you start thinking about what motivates politicians, we have to recognize what motivates politicians is fear. So we're going to talk about what is the way to bring fear into this equation so that they can be motivated, fear can motivate them, to want to talk about ways to change the system. So there's been an enormously successful movement out there, groups like Move to Amend um, uh, leading this, to rally people to get their members of Congress to propose an amendment to the Constitution to overturn Citizens United. <laughs> and this movement has succeeded in getting um, almost a dozen now states to pass resolutions saying, please, will you propose such an amendment? Thousands of local districts and other organizations rallying to suggest this transformation. And last summer, 1.9 million signatures turned into the Senate asking them to actually pass this amendment to the Constitution. But this activism is of the form of a letter to Congress that says, please, please, you know, cure yourself, pretty please. Which, of course, gets filed in the circular file that exists in most uh, House and Senate offices, right? It's not a strategy of fear. It's a st strategy of obsequiousness, right? Fear needs to focus on what can the movement be doing that could actually produce a consequence that members of Congress would need to reckon and begin to react against. And here there is an opportunity in Article 5. It's not the ordinary way of amending the Constitution. It's instead Article 5's mechanism for triggering a call for an Article 5 convention. Now, an Article 5 convention is not a constitutional convention. Constitutional convention, in theory, has the power to do whatever the, the hell it wants. All an Article 5 con uh, convention can do is follow a procedure for proposing amendments to the Constitution. It's not a convention that has the power to amend the Constitution. So when people are fearful of Article 5 conventions, what they have to be fearful of is an idea coming out of an Article 5 convention that is really, really crazy, but still succeeds in getting three quarters of the states to ratify it. Okay, I'm not saying it's a zero probability, but we have to understand it's a low probability. Now, never before have we had an Article 5 convention. We came close once. 1911, I think, is the last moment we came close. This was at a time when Congress um, had a Senate, and the Senate was selected by legislators, state legislators. There was a big movement to get the Senate to be directly elected because people thought that was the source of corruption in that Congress. So in the movement to get them to directly elected, they sent letters to Congress, please propose an amendment to change the way the Senate is selected. Um, Congress ignored, that, uh, th ignored those letters. So uh, the states started proposing an Article 5 convention for the purpose of changing the way the Senate was selected. And when they came within one state of having enough states to force Congress to call that convention, finally Congress flipped on this issue and sent out the 17th Amendment, which became the amendment that created an elected Senate. And my reluctant view is that we might have the same dynamic necessary here. That this convention process pressures reform in two ways. One, just the expectation that the convention would be confronted. But two, in the fact that these convention 
movements can be organized and operate at the local level. It's something for each state to actually engage in in a way that fuels the movement of the states. And I kind of think that if you're a member of Congress and you see this spreading across the country and this call for these conventions, there's a certain point at which um, you recognize the fear that's appropriate here. And that fear is exactly what suggests the way this problem ultimately could be solvable. OK, it is solvable. I agree with Senator Murphy. It is solvable. I also think it must be solved. Um, we don't have a choice about whether our government is capable of addressing the most important issues, put aside the less important issues like copyright term or internet policy, the most important issues like climate change or healthcare policy or financial reform. We don't have a choice if we want to keep the status of this nation as a leading democracy in the world. We don't have that choice. And the only way to get to the place that we have confidence again in this government is to remove what has evolved to be this debilitating pathological corruption inside the system, a corruption our framers would have recognized even if our Supreme Court doesn't yet see. OK, that's all I'd like to say. I'm happy to take some questions. I'm a law professor, so I cold call on people if you don't ask questions. Hi, Professor Lessig. Blair Bowie with US Perg. I'm wondering why uh, calling for a convention somehow has more power than states passing resolutions for the amendment, which are, there are now 13 states that have done that. Why is that going to be scarier to Congress than? people being able to move their state legislatures or pass through ballot initiative a call to overturn Citizens United? Right. So if 34 states pass a resolution that says, dear Congress, please propose an amendment to the Constitution, nothing happens. You know, Congress can ignore it, and there is no legal consequence to them ignoring it. But if 34 states passed a resolution that says, this state calls on Congress to convene an Article 5 convention, then there has to be an Article 5 convention. And it's the very fact of the convention which is terrifying to Congress. So my point is each resolution passed in the states gets us one step closer to an event which has legal significance. But the passing of resolutions to get Congress to pass and propose an amendment has no legal consequence. Now, you might say it could have political consequence, but so too would passing resolutions at the state level to call on Congress to propose an Article 5 convention have political consequence. So it has political consequence on both sides, but one has legal consequence in addition to political consequence, and that's why I think it ultimately might be the most more effective. And the other thing is, you know, let's say you've got five states to pass it very quickly. Then you'd have a whole bunch of people who begin to say, well, this is a kind of a fun thing. Let's see how we can get more states to pass these resolutions. And as you got closer, there'd be even more excitement and energy driven to this movement to try to get these states to pass these resolutions in a way that I think with the resolution response that we've seen right now, as Congress does nothing, it kind of dampens the enthusiasm down for actually getting more states to pass these resolutions. So let me be very clear. I didn't say this clearly enough here. I think the movement to get the states to pass resolutions has been the most important thing in the past four years in making this issue salient and important to Americans. I would not have given up that movement for anything. So it's not, but because, only because that movement has succeeded in getting millions of people focused on this issue in a way that gives them a taste for something actually happening. So that was a wonderful, amazingly powerful, brilliant first step. It wasn't my idea of a first step. I thought we should have done something different. So I'm speaking against interest when I say it was the brilliant first step. But I think we need to recognize it was just a first step. And now the question is, what do we do to move them to the next step that gets us closer to having the political power necessary to bring about the kind of change that, that we all have to have? Yale Political Science Department. Uh, so there's... Um, sort of incongruence between how you described a lot of what motivates donors and also the same thing with the last panel uh, between how I see it, which is I spent a lot of time at these high dollar fundraisers and in the call center at the DCCC and 
it seems to me that most of these big donors, the 0.1 or whatever percent, are hobbyists rather than lobbyists. They are people, they're not ideologues and they're not asking for anything. They, they want to be called by a politician because politicians are celebrities and they want to go to cocktail parties and mingle with other rich people and talk about politics because <coughs> for most people politics is no more than a hobby. And when I think about these big dollar donors, I think not all of them are like that, but maybe the mo mo most of them are. Most of the ones certainly who attend these different fundraising events are. Um, and the reason I bring that up, because I, I wonder whether this is the population that needs to be co-opted, <laughs> whether they don't actually care about getting things, uh, they just care about being involved in politics. And, and in, in settings like this, when we talk about money in politics, they're often treated as a, this kind of, the, the bad guys. Um, and I wonder if that's the wrong framing and strategic approach. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so first, I do agree it's wrong to think of them as the bad guys. And, you know, I, I also think it's wrong for reformers to somehow think that they are not proper reformers if they play the game the way everybody else plays the game. I think Chris Murphy today was absolutely right when he responded to the question about, you know, what do you, what do you think, I think it was your question, what do you think when the big money's on your side with, look, you know, I got to get into office and do what I can when I'm in office and this, I'm happy for the support that this gives me. And I think so long as they've committed themselves firmly to reforming the system, they're innocent in, in this respect. You know, because the people who say, I'm not taking any big money, I'm only going to take $5 for each contributions, they are not people sitting in Congress, right? They lose. Um, um, and so you might be right. I, I don't think you know, these are necessarily bad people. There are a lot of them motivated for the best possible reasons to be inside of politics. But again, an issue that came up in the first panel I think is absolutely powerful and right. We have to think about the effect on the margin. So even if 90% of those people are in it just because they want the photo op, what that means is the candidate doesn't care about what those 90% think about, but the candidate is even more than focused on what the marginal 10% think about. Right? So you think about political parties in you know, like Israel where the, where the smallest party might have the most power in determining what in fact the parliament does. That's the similar point that goes on here. So if what you're saying is true, it only exacerbates the sense in which it's the tiniest fraction of the population that is driving or creating the kind of dependency that I'm talking about. Um, and so uh, it doesn't change the ultimate policy prescription, which is we have to find a way to spread that influence out, you know, now over the size of the, all those funders, but now not just over the funders, but over everybody as well. Thanks so much for uh, this presentation. Just, just to uh, maybe push that point a little bit further, um, when I think about what's influencing elected officials. You know, Chris Murphy this morning talked about going to these cocktail parties in DC where there's this highly stable community of special interest representatives, uh, you know, both in, from environmental groups as well as from the, you know, chemical industry or whatever. Uh, and that um, that's not gonna change if we reform how, how money is used in elections. The, the stable discursive community. and. Your, your attention to the, the level at which corruption works at the level of institutions I think is really important, but I think there's an even higher level, and, and maybe corruption is not the word, in which the discursive communities in, in which these politicians are spending their time just are, are highly wedded to the, the sort of status quo in a really deep sense. And I'm not sure that getting money out of politics is going to address that you know, even deeper level of, of, of influence. Okay, so first of all, let's be clear about language. I don't want to get money out of politics. I want money in politics. I want to change the way we fundraise that money. If we change the way we fundraise that money, the economy of lobbying changes dramatically. Right? It's not the case that we get rid of lobbyists, and we shouldn't get rid of lobbyists. Lobbyists are essential. They're really critical to help Congress understand how Congress is about to screw up some new industry. Right? So, so I'm not against that information being there. But the dependence that members have on the favor of the lobbyist has been changed dramatically because no longer is the member looking for the lobbyist to, in some subtle and legal way, channel the money to the campaign of that member that that member needs. Now the lobbyist is just one more person pleading with the member for the member's attention. And what that does is not you know, disable them, but it changes the way in which they are super enabled given the way we fund the system. You know, as John Edwards used to say when we used to quote John Edwards, there's all the difference in the world between a lawyer making an argument to a jury and a lawyer handing out $100 bills to the jurors. 
But our lobbying system doesn't understand that difference. And so if you made that as a difference, they would be in the business of making arguments. Now, if they were just in the business of making arguments, I would predict members of Congress would not spend as much time as they do going to their stupid parties, you know, because they are just not fun. It is just not a fun way to live their life. Um, Sar Sarbanes describes how in his first six years in Congress, he had lunch with a colleague six times, any colleague six times over those six years. And the answer was, well, you know, if you have time for lunch, you have time to fundraise or to go to a fundraiser and who would go, who would have lunch with somebody if you could go to a fundraiser or be fundraising. But the point is if you got to a world where that's not the way they fundraised, if instead it was fundraising through the ways you would expect $50 contributions to be raised, they would have more time to do the sort of thing they used to do, not back in the 19th century. You know, we're talking about getting back to a world of the 1970s and the 1980s. It's not a radical difference that we're talking about. It's just a difference sufficient enough to get us back to a Congress it could actually do something, could actually legislate because it didn't have these forces. You know, the way Chris Murphy today was just brilliant. They're just describing the way from the very first moment you're speaking in a way that makes it feel like a sin to sit down with somebody on the other side and talk to that person. So this is polarization in the way that Ezra is very focused on it, but the point is to recognize the way in which the fundraising is helping to drive the polarization. So take that all away. We are still left with a political society which is demographically more polarized than it was in 1970, no doubt. But at least, you know, we're doing, about, we're doing something about the thing we can do something about constitutionally. Like, you can imagine we could lobotomize half of the American public and that would deal with polarization too, but, but that's just not constitutionally permissible to lobotomize the American public. So let's do the thing we can do something about, which is to change the way uh, we fund elections. Okay, great. Yeah. New York University. Um, first of all, I found that your talk really interesting because I thought the idea of institutionally putting fear in the minds of members of Congress really inspired. But I'm also sort of nervous that we're ahead of the public or everybody in this room is ahead of the public because that idea of putting fear into members of Congress is based on members of the public going along with this and to the extent that going along with this means at the end of the day they're going to support some sort of matching funds, I think that's really tough at the moment because if, if you look at what, what I've seen in public opinion on this, people just freak out as soon as you say give money to politicians. And so I'm, I'm sort of nervous that we're way ahead of what is palatable politically at the yeah. moment. So I'm so sort of curious about your take on that. First I'd suggest that in fact the data is much more complicated than that makes it seem. Um, I, I'm pretty confident we have the support in the public for the ideas. Um, here's where the problem is. Claris did a poll last summer where they found that 80% of Americans believe every single reform Congress has ever passed, it is passed for the purpose of benefiting it and disabling competitors. So if a member of Congress stands up and says, I've got a great new idea, it's called matching funds, it's going to make it so we have competitive elections, 80% of Americans will discount that and think the reason you're saying this is you're just trying to benefit yourself. And this points to a really fundamental problem we as a political society have about even imagining what the solution here would be. I testified at the Senate last July um, and talked about, uh, you know, in Citizens United, and the question was, um, you know, what they should do for an amendment to address Citizens United. And I said, look, your biggest problem is not coming up with the amendment. That's pretty easier. The biggest problem is coming up with the amendment that the American public would believe is actually a, a, a solution to the problem. And it's not just that Congress can't give us that answer. There is no institution in American society the Americans trust right now. The law professors, they would not trust. The church, they would not trust. The ACLU, they would not trust. You know, you tell me the organization that a cross-partisan group of Americans would actually trust here. So I agree with you, we have an enormously difficult task to produce an idea in a way that America would buy. But I also think that the data that comes from people like uh, Tibbings uh, and, uh, 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 I'm sorry, um, Tibbings and Tease Morris suggests that the Americans, Americans are deeply focused on these process issues and are desperate for a kind of reform that gives them a reason to believe that Congress is just not playing an insider's game for the benefit of the insiders. Um, I wonder if you could talk about um, the, your, the part where you were talking about fear and members of Congress and that part of this is getting them to a point where they feel safe passing small donor a small donor system, but what I'm hearing out of Albany right now, 
um, where just such a system is being proposed is that what is the most creating the most fear is independent expenditures. So in the small donor model, how do you think about dealing with that part of the problem, which right. may be a barrier to passing the reform? Right. So I said we could take the first step in solving this problem without addressing the constitutional issue. And the more expanded answer to that is, it may be that we then need to address the constitutional issue. But I think there are, are, are a couple reasons to recognize why we might not need to address the constitutional issue. One very hopeful reason is the Supreme Court will find a way to back off from the extremism of Citizens United and the Arizona Free uh, Enterprise case. And I think it's possible for them to back off. I think it's possible for Kennedy to save face and back off from the more extreme version of that, especially if they understood you know, the kind of dependence, corruption, originalism point that I'm making right here. It gives them a way to talk about corruption, which is not, we were wrong in Citizens United. We were right in Citizens United. Citizens United, the nonprofit filmmaker, of course ought to have the right to spend its corporate funds to promote its film. That has nothing to do with corruption under any sense of corruption. But that's separate from the question whether people should be able to contribute unlimited amounts of money to an independent political action committee to spend in a, an election. That's a different issue. And so I think jurisprudentially, there's a way for them to actually back off from Citizens United um, uh, consistent with what they did in Citizens United, or back off from the implications of Citizens United. But even if it's not likely that they will do this, it's a very old court. In 10 years, you know, the key people here, or two of the key people here, will no longer be on that court, right? So the idea of us building a progressive movement to take on a decision of the Supreme Court, which in 10 years will disappear anyway, just seems to me like a wrong waste of our resources. We ought to be focusing our resources on a political movement that would actually address the thing that we really have the hard work to do, which is to convince the American people we have to change the way we fund elections. That is the necessary change, and it might be the sufficient change, but it certainly is the necessary change if we're ever going to get to a, a system of elections that we have a reason to trust. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on two alternative sources of political resistance to these reforms, one being a sort of bipartisan resistance um, based on the advantages that the current system has for all members uh, of Congress, um, which you've written very compellingly on, um, and the other is a sort of partisan resistance where if the reforms become uh, cast or framed in a way that they're perceived as advantaging one party versus the other, then not only will that create huge resistance among you know, enough people to veto those reforms, but also allow them to then cast those reforms in a way that will undermine their support among roughly half of the public. Right. right. Both questions, I think, point to the same answer. Um, and it's a really hard answer for us post 20th century people to accept. So the 20th century model of big social movements that succeed gets captured by the kind of civil rights movement, which for us is captured by the idea of like one or two really important leaders who define the movement. And we have big organizations supporting the movement. And it finally takes on the great power of whatever and wins. That's not the way this movement can work. This movement has to look a lot more like the progressive movement at the beginning of the last century. Right? The progressive movement at the beginning of the last century didn't have television or even radio. Right? They didn't have a single organization that defined the progressives. There were progressives from every single sector. There were conservative progressives, Alaya Root, and there were liberal progressives um, um, you know, in, in the Democratic and the Republican Party. There were progressives of every sort, and they spoke to the progressively relevant issue of their own group. Right? But what made them progressives was the recognition that the political system was no longer delivering the promise of a democracy, which is a connection between what the people wanted and what the government actually did. And so they fought on their own little issue, but could, could resonate on the bigger issue that we have some big, some big case to take on. And in 1912, remember we have four candidates for president in 1912, a socialist, Debs, a Stan Pat Republican, Taft, and two self-described, quote, progressives, one Teddy Roosevelt and one Woodrow Wilson. But the progressivism of Roosevelt and Wilson are very different progressivism, right? And between the two progressives, 70% of the American public vote for a progressive, um, which 
points to the fundamental recognition, even though there's significant divergence here. Now, what that means for us today, I think, is that we need to find a way to build a movement that is one outside the Beltway, so it's not Democrats and Republicans inside Washington that are lead champions. They are going to be important, ultimately, to passing the legislation, but they are not important in building the movement. And two, that constantly recognizes the critical importance to keeping conservatives on, uh, uh, as prominent as liberals. So again, uh, Josh Silver is here, uh, and he runs, um, uh, well, United Republic, I mean, not United Republic, um, United Republic and Represent Us. But what Represent Us has been doing is working extremely hard to promote very strong conservatives. Uh, and we had a conference, a Root Strikers conference in San Francisco, where the guy who was the former Bush ethics czar, a guy named Richard Painter, was on the stage. And he advanced the most radical um, voucher-like solution, Bruce Ackerman's idea, um, of all of them. He wanted a $200 voucher to everybody. He said this is a taxation without representation point, like every one of us ought to be represented in the funding, and I should not have to pay any taxes until I have $200 in a voucher amount. Um, and that's exactly the kind of rhetoric and positioning that I think is going to be necessary to balance the general perception that it's a bunch of liberal Democrats who are pushing this idea. So, you know, people say to me, can't you now get Barack Obama to take up this issue? And in my heart of hearts, the answer is, I don't want him to take up this issue. It's exactly, it, would be, it would be poison for him right now to take up this issue. I don't think he has the constitutional standing to bring about the change anyway. You know, if I thought he did, then maybe it would be different. But I don't think he does. But the point is, if he did take this up as the big issue, then um, you're right. It would be framed as a Democrat's issue. And, and there's no way to make fundamental reform here without having cross-partisan support. It, as hard as it is for me, the Democrat, to admit, only Nixon goes to China. It might be that the real hope we have is if some credible Republican sort of finally recognizes why this is a total win-win for them to take this up as their core anti-crony capitalism issue that most uh, grassroots Republicans care about. Um, I was just curious what you make of these, the other line of efforts short of constitutional amendment that you've got going on now on the corporate side, just the, the shareholder movement, the, what the SEC is talking about now, uh, this, this uh, proposal to go through state corporate law, to sort of revise state corporate law to make it tougher. I, mean, I know b business spending is only one part of this, but what do you make of that whole line of? So I guess my view is I'm not against it but I don't want a lot of resources devoted to it. Because you know, I, I share Michael's view that I don't really think the corporate money is the issue. You know, from the, I mean, we have a good point that's made by the transparency people that we don't actually know how much corporate money was in this election because of the secret money was there. But the money that we do know, it's 11% of the super PAC money. Um, so solve that problem. If super Citizens United had gone completely the other way, and embolden the FEC to stamp out all corporate influence, we still would have a way of funding the election where the tiniest fraction of the 1% was funding the election. So I, of course I'm for transparency, of course I'm for corporate responsibility, of course I'm for all of these reforms, they're all great, but if we to get all of them, we are still nowhere closer to addressing the core problem here, which is this kind of corruption. So i um, you know, happy that they're doing it, but please don't waste your time doing more of it. Well, on that note, we're not going to waste our time. We're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to head downstairs for the, I guess, the third half of our program, to use the car tech uh, phrasing. And uh, I will just say what I've said many times before, that Pam Green will be standing out there on your way down. If you, if you want to talk about your travel, you have any questions about uh, the rest of the day, you should talk with her. And I think we should all give a very warm round of applause uh, to, to Larry Lessig.